All right, Karen, thanks for joining us. And uh, we're gonna get started our workshop. Go ahead, the floor is yours. All right, thanks. Well, hi everybody, nice to see you. My name is Karen Cubby and Holly Hart and I are here in the bead lab of my bead store in downtown Iowa City. So thanks for joining us to talk about green women running for office. Um, it'd be really great to uh, have lots of people here because we need women running because we know that when women run a broader array of issues get talked about, we know from research that the process whereby decisions are made are a little bit different and it can be very effective for providing leadership to the Green Party to have women running for office. So this is, I, um, this really comes from a three day workshop that I put together as someone who's on the left, a third party person. My party history is mostly with the Socialist Party USA, although also as a Green Party member in the past and realizing that a lot of third party folks, we need to figure out how to meld our content and our process with the electoral strategy. And we're not very schooled in that and we can do better. And so I put together a three day workshop that was very experiential. So you're gonna get some highlights today and lots of time for Q and A to make sure that I'm speaking to the areas that are most interest to you. But since there aren't a lot of people here, I thought that we could uh, just see who's in the room. So since I'm not seeing a lot of people, maybe we could go around and just say your name, where you're living, what interests you about electoral work, and if there is an office you're interested in running in. And that would be great for me to know, because that might skew my remarks a little bit. So Robin, you were in the room first. Do you mind unmuting and giving us some of that information? Or Hillary, will you go? Sure, hi everyone. Um, I'm Hillary Kane. I am the party's national treasurer. I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, what interests me about electoral work? Um, I think because it's a time of the year that the people who are sort of not political um, actually pick their head up out of the sand and sort of pay attention for a few minutes. And it's a, to me a great way to sort of like try to nab a few people to get them to become, you know, more active and more activist um, and to really, you know, wake people up. Um, and um, yeah, I don't want to go on because we'll take forever, but I have not run for office myself, but I have certainly supported many a campaign. I now seem to be typecast in the treasurer role, but I've done other things and, um, and that's about it. So I will pass it back. Thanks, Hillary. Jackie, would you mind going next? Hi, I'm Jackie Devineau. I live up here in Portland, Maine. Um, I, I, I have never run for office myself, but I've worked on, with the exception of the last presidential campaign, I've worked directly um, on every presidential campaign we have had. Uh, and within our state, all of our governor, green governor races and, and candidates that have run locally and statewide. Um, so I'm a, kind of the backup crew for candidates and I'm always interested, especially in the women in this party uh, running because boy, do we have some strong women in this party. So that's me. Thanks, Jackie. Yeah. Amy, are you there? Yes. Sorry about my uh, my dilapidated computer. Um, Amy Sachs, Portland, Oregon. So Pacific Green Party. Uh, I guess mostly I pay attention to electoral work just out of force of habit because I've always voted, even when it felt deeply depressing. Uh, I know locally one of my favorite Greens, uh, Natalie Paravicini, is probably going to run again this year, I believe, for Secretary of State. So I'm hoping when I have time that I can reach out to her and uh, maybe provide her a little assistance. Um, I guess my story is I want to support women candidates despite um, my very jaundiced permanent disappointment with whatever 
U.S. feminism is because, you know, Democrats. <laughs> and end of that lament for now. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. And let's see, Robin must have left us. There's a creator, Chris, that is here. Hey. Um, so we're, asking, yeah. we're asking people just to say their name, where you're from, and what your interests are in electoral work. Uh, Christopher Ackman. I'm the prince. It's the communist revolution. <laughs> um, I live in SoCal. Uh, and the elections, well, we got to obviously uh, win the green movement. Uh, so pretty much I just want uh, to have democracy across the world and have this be the promised land as the name, not USA. And uh, I guess the office of interest is any one that I'd support. Um, I'm not really running. Um, and story, I started working on Ecomedia, making the universal homepage when I was studying at UC Berkeley. And it's been about a decade and getting ready to launch it.eco. Um, and it pretty much supplies for the one currency uh, market. Um, and so this decade of the communist revolution gets us to zero GHG emissions. Um, we're at like the 420 CO2 supernova in heaven. <laughs> we gotta, um, pretty much just keep it green and clean. All right. Thanks, Chris. We also have Deborah with us. Hello. Hi, Deborah. We can hear you. Uh, hi, um, my name is Deborah. I'm from the Metro Detroit, Michigan area. Uh, what interests me about electoral work is affecting changes locally, like hands on um, listening to the community's lead needs and um, addressing them and uh, making sure that uh, these needs are being heard. And my office of interest, uh, God, uh, that'd be really hard to choose because I think everything is important to me. Um, infrastructure, um, health, environment. Uh, so I don't know, I have to have a hard time choosing which one. And my story, um, while I'm originally from the East Coast, I joined the Green Party in uh, 2015. I was an organizer for the uh, 15 Now to um, raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour back in 2015. And it is 2021 and things haven't changed because every time we fight for a living wage in this country, um, the, uh, well, I would say the capitalist system doesn't want that to happen, doesn't want the poor people to have their needs met. They want to keep us working uh, to the point of uh, sickness and dying because uh, all we do is work. Uh, we work and we don't have um, a life. Um, and we don't have, some of us don't even have a, a roof over our heads. Uh, some of us don't even have access to healthy, uh, good quality food. So um, that's a couple of things that um, concern me amongst others, but um, that mm -hmm. would be it. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. And Robin's back with us. Robin, will you just introduce yourself and maybe say what interests you about electoral work? Yes, my name is Robin Harris. I'm in Orlando, Florida. 
Um, well, because I uh, just, uh, my interest in electoral work is I've uh, just recently um, filed to run for uh, state representative um, here in Florida. This would be my second run. My first run was county commission, the state run. Um, no one has had a chance to vote since 2016. So um, I thought I would never do this again, but here I am. Thanks. <laughs> All right, congratulations and thank you. Uh, sometimes repetition is what it takes. That's how people learn in general is through repetition. So um, even though it might be a different office that Robin's running in, there might, there's probably gonna be the same core values of issues that you're talking about. Um, so I wanna tell you my story pretty briefly because I think it's instructive because I think it's pretty common from other people's stories where uh, I was a campus activist and a community activist and a labor activist, and something happened in my community that made me mad. And so I started inquiring about it and found out, oh, I need to go to these city council meetings to see what's happening. And I started going to these meetings and I started realizing there's a lot of things that I care about that in local government is being worked on kind of some of the things that Deborah was talking about these practical things and as a, a democratic socialist feminist I really identified with the socialists in Milwaukee who deemed themselves sewer socialists uh, who were wanting to make sure that people were housed now that there was parks and recreation services for children now that the schools were safe that there was clean water and good sewer system and these practical things that make families safe, that make communities safe and, and are therefore makes the whole community safe. And so I, I ran in 1985 against a couple of very well-liked incumbents. I got trounced at the ballot box, but some of the issues that we talked about happened. And so we felt a lot of momentum from that effort. So that issue was making Iowa City a nuclear free zone. And there was a movement across the country in the mid eighties, uh, across um, Interstate 80, which were near, uh, that if communities were nuclear free zones, then nuclear waste and components for nuclear energy couldn't be transported across the country and we could disrupt things a little bit. So even though we lost, Iowa City became a nuclear free zone. So I ran again in 1987 and our, our focus was really about the public library and that there was some budget cuts and when library services are curtailed, it really impacts the community. Because for me, it's a little uh, corny, but the library is kind of the cornerstone of democracy. It's where everyone's equal. It's where people have access to information and technology and research librarians. <laughs> And so during our campaign, the other thing that was lost when the library was closed a day a week was we lost a story hour. And I, I was a high school science teacher. And so I provided a story hour during the regular time. And so child care centers brought their kids to outside the library where the doors were locked and the Cubby for Council campaign provided a story hour. Well, this time we didn't get trounced. We lost by just about 2%. And that next budget session, the library was fully funded. We had provided enough pressure from the campaign. So this felt very empowering to us that we're working on the campaign, not just to me as a candidate, but to the community of people that were working on the campaign. So we ran again in 89 during a special election where a lot of students and younger people were out of town. And this time we won by just about over 2%. So, a couple days later, I had to take office and start making, you know, multi-million dollar budget decisions. So I was very happy to be a prepared person ready to go. So one of the reasons I want to talk about that is that there are lots of ways of establishing a win during a campaign. And for me, it was also important to look at kind of the larger picture of how does electoral work fit in with other organizing strategies. And 
for me, being a good organizer means I have to have three legs in order for my stool to be really sturdy. So I can sit on it firmly and I'm not gonna fall down. And for me in that community organizing stool, you've got um, educational campaigns where you're communicating with the community about why a living wage is important and what effects it will have on, the, on individual people, on people's ability to be housed and have healthcare and ability to kids to have the right size soccer shoes and the ability to just be healthy. And so there's an educational campaign. You might have direct action where you host rallies or teach-ins um, or you're trying to shut an office down. And when you combine those educational campaigns, the direct action and electoral work, you can really build momentum in your community for your organizing. And so electoral work isn't the only thing that should be done. I think it's strongest when it's done with these other two strategies. Uh, so for me, it's uh, when we're talking about women running for office, it's really important to know that there's lots of research out there right, there, right now that really talks about the gender differences in recruiting and training candidates. In general, you need to ask women many more times than you ask a man. So you need to ask and ask and ask. Uh, women tend to want to be super prepared. And so uh, it's important to provide that training and support and mentors for people. And one of the things we did here in our community was start a program called Electing Progressive Women. And we got 50 women in a room who were interested in running for office. And they all talked about what would make them step forward to actually get that candidacy petition, what offices they were interested in. And we found out a lot of information that is also very much a collabor uh, corroborated through the research. So we had like the next 14 election, local election cycles mapped out one woman would say, I want to run for county board of supervisor, but I can't do it till my youngest is in kindergarten and in school for half the day. It's like, great, what year is that? So we look at that year and start looking at those offices and start looking at what can she do to prepare herself to be, a, uh, to have comfort plunging in when her youngest is in, in kindergarten. So you can really map this out if you have a mind to. Uh, the other thing that's really important to think about as women candidates is a lot of times people kind of assume that there are um, uh, topics that women will talk about. Uh, reproductive health care is one of them, which is a really critical uh, topic right now. It may not be so much a topic in local government, but certainly if you're doing state politics or national politics, it's really critical. Although there's plenty of stuff locally that can be done. But I wanna make the case that we need to talk about childcare issues as an economic development issue. That when, if, if businesses need employees and they want the best pool of candidates, they need to be queer friendly. They need to make sure that they are child friendly businesses, that they offer good wages and healthcare. And when you do all those things in combination, you have a great pool of candidates in your community that can then support that business. So um, knowing these differences is really important so that when a woman says, no, I don't wanna do that, to know that it's not to pressure people, it's to know that there may be some other things that are in their lives that prevent them from saying yes and asking those questions and then providing uh, that support for them. So for me, one of the most important things uh, about running a campaign is defining the win. Because if you have a broad definition of winning an electoral campaign, it really dictates how do you spend your time as a candidate? How do volunteers spend their time? Where do you spend the amount of money that you have? So spending some time defining a win is really important. And maybe even before you do that, thinking about kind of running a people's campaign, there are probably three kinds of campaigns that happen. One is kind of um, a cult of personality. 
you have a person who is dynamic, that is energetic, that is charismatic, that is articulate, that is likable and is willing to work hard. And people will gravitate towards that person. And this kind of campaign can have a lot of momentum, but probably only for a moment. So it's really important that that charismatic person is connected to a larger organization and larger goals for the community and not just kind of an ego-based campaign. Uh, because it, that kind of campaign really does little to build the movement in your community. So the second kind of people's campaign is one about educating your community about an issue. And so um, it's a tool that you can use to reframe issues like I tried to do just in talking about childcare as an economic development issue. Um, and it really can help build the movement and build the Green Party as well. And then the third way is to think about electoral work as, as building the Green Party. So one of your defines of a win might be how many more people are registered as green after the election as term, in comparison to before the election. So the things that I wanna encourage you to do when you're defining a win is to have them be um, metrics that you can measure them or that if they're qualitative uh, that you can get some uh, surveying or some anecdotal information from people. So certainly a win is defined by winning at the ballot box. It's an important definition of win. But there are lots of other ways to be effective at changing things in the community. And one of them is to control the agenda, to guide the campaigns of other candidates by being clear and articulate about what you think are the important things are and asking can other candidates to speak to those issues and talk about your differences. You might do that by starting pretty early in the campaign season to get out there so everyone looks to you. And every time someone else joins the race, they're also saying, well, Robin Harris has been has announced her candidacy and as well as Jim. And then, then, then Carol jumps in and it's, well, Robin started her campaign in January and then there's Jim and then there's Deborah. So um, that repetition, getting your name out there, it's a little bit of marketing, but it is, it's also about familiarity. And so making sure that people aren't um, afraid of you with that Green Party label, that they can better understand what it is. And that means getting out there and there's no getting around physically getting out there and interacting with people. One of the goals of your campaign may be that disenfranchised communities grow, vote in greater percentages in that particular race than in the past. So you might have a neighborhood that is predominantly people of color, and they might not vote in local elections as a body, as a neighborhood. You can look at those percentages from previous races and then look at it afterwards if you spend a lot of time in that neighborhood, see if that neighborhood in general tended to vote in greater numbers. That's a win. You've got more people involved in more local issues. If your coalition has broadened, so maybe you started the campaign out with your core group being Green Party members, but if by the end of the campaign, you have local queer organizations, you have the lay of some people in the labor movement and some neighborhood organizations, you can see that that coalition is building around the campaign. Maybe you can work to keep that coalition together around issues in between the campaigns, whether or not you've won at the ballot boxes. Um, uh, we worked one campaign where our, one of our candidates actually was unopposed. And so we took that opportunity to use it as a training ground so that I didn't always have to be the campaign manager because it can be exhausting. And so we used it as an opportunity so that the treasurer, the campaign manager, the volunteer coordinator and the media person all had kind of a second chair and so we ran the campaign as if there was opposition, which really got issues out. And we trained some other people in how to do electoral work. And of course, it's always gonna build a candidate's skills and increase their exposure by running multiple times or by um, just being out there. So by defining your win, it's gonna dictate 
How do you use volunteers? Where do you spend money? How do you use media? And if people have questions during my presentation, you should feel free to raise your hand. Actually, I see Robin has a hand raised. I just want to mention there's a number of chat. Uh, it looks like there are a lot of chat comments, so I assume Dave is monitoring. Oh, I see. Questions. So, Dave, if there are any commonalities between comments or questions, if you could take a look in the chat so I can speak to those issues. And Robin, did you have a question or comment at this time? So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure how that happened, but no, not at this time. Okay. There's still one person that did not speak. I put it in your chat, Karen. Oh, I'm not seeing them on the sidebar. There's a baby with a raised hand. Uh, Amy, did you have a question? This Tad that didn't speak. Yes. I guess, I guess it's... I guess it's kind of a follow-up because you've already been talking about reproductive rights. I, I wonder how green women candidates can contend with this sort of rock in a hard place in that we know that organizations like Planned Parenthood have real problems. For example, they don't, they don't support Medicare for all. They busted a union in one of their state chapters, though I dis, dis recall which state it was. Uh, I wonder how we can support reproductive freedom and still talk about the problems of these organizations, including their hostility to a better uh, elect election system than the one we have now. Thanks. I think it really matters what your conditions are on the ground level. You might have a local feminist clinic that is a nonprofit that is uh, not a Planned Parenthood that might be a, a, a way to uh, talk about a positive example of providing reproductive justice, which for me means you've got the issues of reproductive health care and that health care provision and all the targeted laws about that. But then you have, when you talk about reproductive justice, it's a much broader agenda that includes housing and transportation and child care and living wages. And so you can really zoom out to talk about how all those things are part of reproductive justice. Um, and it may not be relevant to the campaign to talk about the problems. Uh, I mean, it matters what office you're running for. So certainly um, some of those union busting things can, should and should come up. I think that there are creative ways to talk about women's reproductive justice and not say that you have to swallow the whole Planned Parenthood pill. <laughs> I think it's our obligation as activists to critique where we can critique in the most respectful and direct way possible. Um, and still say they're, they're important, but there's some improvements that need to be made in terms of justice as well. Anybody else have a comment about that? Okay. So when you're thinking about running, there's some things you need to think about in terms of kind of pre-campaigning. So uh, the first one is self-acceptance. So do you, how do you feel about yourself? Because you're gonna get, you're putting yourself out there as an individual, even if you have a broad coalition and it's not a person, a cult of personality campaign, you are still the highlighted person. Your name is on the ballot. People are volunteering to put you in office. You need to be willing to hear some critique. You need to be willing to hear the worst thing that can be said about you and figure out how to move forward through that. It might be about past drug use. It might be about sex in the alley in another part of your life. It might be about traffic tickets, incarceration. Um, 
a blow up on Facebook with someone that comes out. So you just need to be willing to see those things about you. So one example, this is maybe not greatest for the Green Party, but I think about when Bill Clinton said that he didn't inhale. So for me, first of all, I thought, well, what a waste of resources. And we know he's not. And so really the best thing for him to have done in that situation is to say, yes, I experimented with marijuana. It didn't really work for me. I don't do it anymore. So I think that the best way to dispel those kinds of skeletons in your closet is to own them and to talk about what that was and what it is for you right now and then move on to your issues. I think making sure it's the right office for you is really important. So if you're known as an activist who's working on environmental issues and specifically water quality, if your county or state has a soil and water conservation district commission, that's an awesome place to get some real work done to actually not just talk about increasing water quality, but getting some money and resources and confronting landowners about increasing water quality. But if you're a social worker who work is, who's working on mental health issues, maybe the Soil and Water Conservation District isn't the place, isn't the right office for you. Maybe it's whatever entity in your area is the one that works on human resources funding to make sure that um, mental health funding is robust, that it's offered in lots of different ways and that police departments are skewing their services towards mental health or skewed towards not calling the police, but instead calling a mental health professional when that is warranted. So really thinking about who are you? What's your area of expertise and passion? What jazzes you? What's going to make you really work hard for that office and be effective in that office? It also is looking at what's up, what offices are available, what, where, maybe where is there no opposition? And that might be another way to look at which office is right for you. Uh, if you have a uh, family, uh, having their support is really important. It's possible to run a campaign with your family not really being into it, but it's a lot more, it's helpful to have that family support. You're not going to be around to provide childcare as much, to mow the lawn, to wash the dishes, to feed the birds, and they're going to need to say, okay, for this period of time, you're going to be a little more absent than usual. <laughs> And we're going to keep you fed and make sure you sleep well and push you out the door so you're at a campaign event on time. You also need organizational support. So if you're a Green Party member and nobody in the Green Party likes you, it makes it just harder <laughs> to run. <laughs> um, it's also important to know that there, there's money, in, that there's um volunteer support from the organization to help you in this endeavor, you're gonna put a lot of personal energy in. You need to know that there's gonna be organizational energy that's put into the campaign as well. You gotta have some time, that's really critical. So if you're working three full-time jobs and you have kids at home, it makes it really hard to run a campaign, to be a candidate during, uh, in a, to be the candidate. Uh, maybe if that's your situation, that you put in some time on someone else's campaign, which also builds your skills for a race at another time when you have more time. It also lets you kind of step into it a little bit to see, do I really want to do this? So the best way to know if you want to be a candidate is to work for someone else's campaign and be really involved so that you understand the momentum and the ups and downs and the time frames and the pressure that's put on the candidate just in terms of needing to be everywhere all the time. Um, it's a great way to know, is this what I wanna do? Is this exciting to me? Am I willing to do this? And I put able to hear a critique on here again, which is kind of going back to the self-acceptance because you're gonna hear things from people. It might be as superficial as, I don't like your eyeglasses. Like, what do you do with that politically, right? Um, but it might also be that the language you're using is just not connecting with voters. 
So whenever I hear a candidate on the left using the word oligarchy when they're running for city council, I'm like, no, I don't want to hear that because for me, it's a turnoff. Even as someone who understands the power of that word and what that word means, I want us to talk about economic fairness. I want us to talk about redistrib just redistribution um, of city resources. I want to make sure there's affordable housing and parks. And I can talk about those things without talking about the oligarchy. Um, so uh, I think it makes us much more relatable and much more successful electorally. So I've kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, so we'll move on. So there's lots of things that you can do to pre-campaign. There's always public hearings going on. And right now there's a lot of public hearings in local governments, both city and county um, about uh, America Rescue Funds. There's millions of dollars out there. And there's lots of different ways uh, that you can get involved in that conversation about how those monies will be spent and it's local entities that will determine that. Uh, in our community, you know, we're talking about $18 million. And some of it I want for short-term short rescue for immigrant families, for example, who did not get any of the COVID monies um, and they're really hurting. But I also want some of that money used for longer term investments in our community in terms of affordable, affordable housing and mental health uh, services. Um, so I, I want some kind of a balance, but that's an opportunity to get involved in public hearings. You know, write letters to the editor, be on Facebook uh, with your ideas and getting your name out and commenting on issues. So people begin to see some some commonality between your comments. You know, as Greens, we tend to have this core set of values and any new issue you can bounce against your core values. And as you write letters and blog more or are communicating in various ways, people will begin to see those common values. So being involved in community organizations is, a, is really important. Um, and I have to say that even even before you announce as a candidate, you can go door to door. Um, as an activist, I used to go door to door and just ask my neighbors what they thought about some things. And it helped me formulate my ideas that I would then go to a public hearing with. And, but it also got me trained in how to do door to door. And it got my neighbors trained that people will come to your door and talk to you. Although I have to say in Iowa, in the colder months uh, past the solstice year, uh, I do not go door to door when it's dark because people do not like a stranger knocking on their door after dark. So uh, you have to, summertime is great for going door to door. So um, volunteering and being part of political campaigns, political organizations and local boards. Uh, Holly Hart is an appointed official in the city of Iowa City. The city council voted her to be on a really important commission that hears from social service agencies about how to spend, spend community development grant monies. And she's making decisions about city funding. And that's a great way to understand how the system works, where the monies come from, and who, who are the people who are doing work, maybe really well, maybe not so well in the community. So those kinds of things can really help you uh, prepare yourself to campaign. So there are tons of elements of a campaign plan. So this list is not exhaustive, but it, um, like in my training there, we kind of go from cradle to grave during a campaign, but identifying the constituency groups that you can connect with because of the issues that are key to your campaign is a really great exercise. You can actually have a little circle in the middle of a piece of paper or on an old fashioned chalkboard about that core group that's your campaign committee. Then you might have another bigger circle that if you're working on mental health issues, you might have housing advocates, mental health professionals, um, uh, and figure out who are all those people um, who might would be interested in that issue. And then you might have a larger group of people who may not seem like they're very connected to mental health issues, but you can figure out how to make that connection. So you can just start broadening that circle of constituencies that might be interested in your campaign. 
when we talk about outreach, um, there are, I think sometimes people think that campaigns can be run totally on social media. And I'm not one of those people. I think social media can be really effective because on Facebook, for example, you can boost a message based on geography and interest groups. And that's really important to do. And it's a really affordable way to reach people, but nothing is as effective as flesh to flesh interaction with people listening to people, meeting people, making sure they're not afraid of you because of the labels that you put on yourself. Um, because um, I was a very out socialist, people were very afraid of me. Um, but when they got to know me, it's like, well, she's smart and funny and yeah, I can relate to her. We like, we both like to garden. Um, and that breaks down a lot of barriers. And those barriers are not as easily broken down on social media. Even if you're doing some live Facebooks where your face and your nonverbals are all shown. So I just wanna really uh, emphasize the importance of, um, of meeting people. And endorsements uh, is kind of a funny thing. So there might be someone in the community that like maybe there's a radical banker in your community who has really turned their financial uh, institution around about redlining issues. And they're really taking more risks, funding small entrepreneurs. Uh, maybe uh, BIPOC businesses are getting more money from this financial institution. You might approach them to see if they would endorse you. Uh, they're obviously someone who's not risk averse. Um, uh, you're going to need a lot of volunteers to run an effective campaign. And it's important to ask people for everything you need. So you, if your mother is in town and is a potential voter, you need to ask your mother for her vote. You need to ask your best friends. You need to ask them for their vote, for their time, for their money, for their endorsement. So don't assume people will give you all those things. You need to turn that into a question and ask them. Um, and with volunteers, people would tell me on the street, you know, I'd love to work on your campaign. It's like, well, don't be telling me that unless you mean it because I'm gonna be contacting you as well as my volunteer coordinator. So I always liked within 48 hours of someone mentioning they wanted to get involved that we contacted them and got them a task. It might have been a really small task, but we get them involved right away. And that kind of short turnaround is, was critical for us building a very wide coalition and a huge cadre of volunteers. And it's very motivating for them because it's kind of like, well, she's kind of organized, so I'm going to support her even more because she's got it together. I'm going to get it together and help out. Um, and there also has to be appreciation for people. And I think a lot of, and I come from the nonprofit world. I was the executive director of the Emma Goldman Clinic, a reproductive health care provider that is also an abortion provider in our community. One of those uh, not affiliated with Planned Parenthood feminist nonprofits providing uh, first and second trimester abortion care in Iowa City. And in non the nonprofit world and the electoral world, I don't think we do a good job of appreciating volunteers. So if you have a crew of people who's getting up at six o'clock in the morning on a Sunday to do a leaflet drop for you, you need to provide them some bagels. You need to say thank you and make sure that they feel appreciated. We just don't do that enough. Um, your materials that you have, um, there are a lot of mistakes and in my live uh, three day um, workshop on this. I have all these really great examples of fun and effective materials and a whole bunch of negative examples uh, that are funny, but they, they just don't work. Um, so I'll give you two examples about materials. Uh, one is called the drop test. So if you have one of my leaflets and you throw it in the air, wherever it lands, you better see my name on it. So I don't care if it's a two, you know, a two-sided leaflet or an origami bird, my name should be wherever it lands. Um, 
The other thing is being relevant. So there is a woman in our community who is running for city council and her last name was is Bus, B-U-S-S. And in our community, the city council and the school board are two separate entities. And so she had a school bus on her city council leaflet. It was like wrong, uh, wrong entity. She could have used a municipal bus and been relevant. But so I use that as a negative example. You need someone who, you need someone like Hillary who is willing to do the paperwork uh, to keep track of your finances and fundraising. You have to be really clear about what the laws are in your locality and your state about raising money. So for example, in our uh, municipality, any, any donation of $100 or more has to be disclosed, their name, address, and contact information. We decided that every um, donation was going to be disclosed so that we just had a totally open book campaign. And this was a lot of paperwork and footwork so that those $5 cash donations at the bar for the music event we had, that people filled out a small form that we had and that my, the Hillary that I had as a treasurer was willing to do all of that work and to turn disclosure forms and reports in on time. If you don't have your signatures correct on your candidacy petition, if you don't turn your reports in on time, those are the things that become an issue instead of the issues that you care about. And you also look very disorganized and that you're not in some people's minds competent to run if you can't follow the rules of the candidacy petition or the campaign. So one of the things that most campaigns do not do is evaluate the campaign. And I really encourage people to do this because at the beginning I was talking about really uh, defining your win. So if you don't go back and go to that neighborhood that is mostly people of color and you spend a lot of time there to see if those neighbors of yours voted in a higher percentage than they did before you spent time there, you'll never know if it was really effective or not. Although I have to say every time that we have done that evaluation, where you spent time is where you get votes. And that's why it's so important to be prepared, to be willing to get out there and be at um, school carnivals and farmers markets and neighborhood associations and having house parties around uh, the geography that your office uh, is in, in. And uh, it's just real important to do that. And we can talk a little about what do you do if you get elected, if people want to talk about that, but there's a whole host of things um, as a green that once you're in that office, there's all kinds of things to be looking at that are kind of hidden uh, justice issues. So I want to make sure that there is time for people to have me speak or have some cross conversation about what you want to know more about. But I also want to make sure that you have there's, um, oh, I don't know, it's maybe a 30 page electoral campaign manual that I put together, although it doesn't have much about social media. But if you search for Cubby campaign manual, you will find it. It will come right up. So Dave, uh, are there questions in the chat or do people wanna raise their hand? Um, there are no belligerent questions in the chat at this time. So if anybody wants to raise their hand and you can call on them, that would be uh, appropriate. There's got to be questions. Oh, Deborah's got her hand up. Actually, um, I may have to make sure everybody has access to their microphones, maybe. While you're doing that, Deborah, can you unmute yourself and ask your question or make a comment? Sorry, I was muted. Um, I've always wondered this because, you know, when you apply for a job in retail um, or wherever, they want your references, they want to see um, what, your are, what your experience is. I often wonder how come that's not 
the same thing for like, you know, like the president of the United States or uh, the governor, because like, I think us citizens should have something like that. So we could take a look at to see their track record, to see what they've done in the community, how active were they, uh, what they care about, um, how many years have they been doing this? Um, because whenever election time comes around, um, like for example, this past election, 2020, um, where Green's running uh, here in um, the state that I live in, Michigan, that I could not find anything about them online. Uh, so it's like I'm kind of voting blindly on on this individual, and I, I don't know what their experience is. I don't I don't know uh, what they're about or what they want to do or what their intentions are. Um, so it's like I'm thinking, what are the uh, like what is it that you have to have or possess uh, in order to run? Do you have to have some kind of background in um, like education, uh, like politically or socially or anything like that? Do you or could you be a regular citizen? Um, do you have to have some kind of foundation in order to be um, a leader? Because people are going to come to you going to um, want you to hear them out and uh, take them seriously. Uh, like what, what is it that you have to possess? And what, it, like, what do you have to do to prepare for that? And so people can take it seriously that you're a genuine person, that you're not there because of ego. You're not there because of a, a political agenda um, to make yourself wealthy or to build yourself up and not your community that as a public servant that you're serving. So like, what is it that you have to possess and have in order to, to move forward, like in whatever local uh, position you want to run for? Thanks for that. I think that if you are interested in running, then you just put yourself out there that we need more quote unquote regular people running. We don't have to have the bank president. We don't have to have the principal of the school. Um, so if the office is the right fit for you, you have that foundation. And so for me, it's kind of weird to hear about a candidate that doesn't have anything online about them. <laughs> Your job as a candidate is that when people hear your name, that they think of two or three things that they identify with you. So for example, when I was running, people, people would think about environmental and development issues, and they would think about someone who represented them. Like I would stand, I would be getting on the bus and someone would say, I've never voted for anyone who won before. You know, but hardly any other city council member then or since has, is a regular bus rider like I am. Um, and so being where you are and being who you are. And so your job in the campaign is to articulate who are you, what qualities do you bring to the table and what are your stands on the issues? How will you behave as an elected person? So if you're at a house party and someone confronts you about something and you yell at them, that's most likely going to be how you behave as an elected official. But if you listen to them, and even if what they say is very upsetting to you, you can actually say that that, that response to a community problem is really upsetting, but here are some other ways that we could deal with that. Then you have, you've started to build relationship with people. You've started to build some trust with people. And I think campaigns who don't articulate who the person is and what they want to accomplish, it means they have a hidden agenda. And the job of a campaign in my mind is to articulate an agenda. So Robin has probably done that. I mean, Robin, you, you're running for office. You have run for office. You put out who you are, I'm assuming, um, in your campaign materials, both written and online. 
Is that true? Could you repeat the last part? Uh, that you have articulated both on paper that you might hand out and online who you are and why you're running and what you want to accomplish. Yes, uh, this is my second race, but I feel like I don't know. I feel like I'm just brain dead. Uh, I guess it's just the jitters right about now. It's like, oh my God, what did I do? So, <laughs> but, yeah, but you but, know who you are, yeah, right? So yeah. sometimes putting that down on paper can be difficult. Um, but I have to say, like Deborah was saying, it's not about ego. And I think what you want to accomplish is not about ego. But I would have to say that having a little bit of ego valuing what you can bring to the table, the voice that you can be, and the perspective that you can bring, and the process that you bring to the campaign should be valued. And at some level, there's some ego in there, not in a negative way, but in a very strong self-accepting way that says, because you have to ask people and say, vote for me, I am worthwhile. I can do this. I can be helpful to the community. And this is why I can be helpful. So you're not doing it for ego, but you need a little bit of ego to do it. <laughs> I see Deborah has her hand up again. I just want to make sure other people don't have comments or questions that they might want to ask. Dave, anything else in the chat? Uh, not at this time. Hillary did drop a link in there for the coordinated campaign committee where you can sign up for additional trainings, uh, which I believe I have a question. If I'm not mistaken. Okay. Robin said she had a question. Go ahead, Robin. Yeah, so um, my race is not until next year, um, but I find myself, uh, I hope I'm not starting too soon. Um, so I guess the question is, what, what is the strategy for the best strategy for a race that no one has had the opportunity to vote in for about four years? Wow. Yeah, so I don't even know what that really means. Like, is it a new office or an office uh -oh. that's been come back? No, the, uh, the one person, um, he, he kept winning or he had no opponent. And the last person, the person who, was, who would be my current opponent he just, uh, all the other folks just dropped out of the race when it was his time to run. And so he just kind of won, he won by default. Uh -huh. So I think you can't start too early. You can create a campaign plan that outlines where are your voters? Where are your organic voters? Where are the voters that you need to win? Like you'll be able to know how many, how many votes am I gonna to need to win? So even though people didn't really have a choice, a lot of people probably voted for the one candidate anyway. And so that's, you're gonna need at least that many votes to win. So where are they gonna come from? And you can start mapping out in that district of that race, where your easy votes are gonna come from and where your harder votes are gonna to have to come from. And you might even start going door to door about the issues this summer about the seat that's up next year. I have to tell you, um, the last time I was a candidate and ran a campaign was in 1995. And I, my first one was in 1985. And I still have people who will come into my bead store and say, in 1985, you knocked on my door and we talked about the bus system and here's what we talked about. Now that's a powerful interaction that this many years later, that they even recognize me, <laughs> um, but they remembered that interaction. You also wanna save some of those easy neighborhoods for you to interact with for days when you're not feeling as chipper, when you're kind of down or you're tired um, or you need a boost for the campaign. So save some of those easy precincts for those moments because they're gonna be there for you with just a little nudge, although you still have to ask them. Um, 
So you can start mapping things out. You can start raising money. You can start putting your name out there. You can start developing the issues and really kind of vetting what's the best way for me to talk about the issues that I care about, which is the reason why I'm running. So you can start doing that now so that by the time the general public is paying attention, you are so used to talking about it that it is super articulate and convincing and concise and really candidential. So a lot of us, we don't start till so late that we don't have time to get it together. We don't have time to really hear how we're talking about things and get feedback about it. And by the time we're really articulate about it, it's like too late. And so you have some opportunities. And Robin, I would say you cannot start too early. Go girl, go. Chris, Karen uh, has a question next, and I want to let you know that there are about 15 minute warning right now. That there's what? I'm sorry? 15 minutes left. Okay. Chris, did you have a question? Hey, yo. Um, well, I was kind of wondering if we can talk about issues uh, since that's something that candidates uh, should be strong in. Um, so, I specifically wanted to connect like the Me Too movement with the Green movement and talk about that a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think there was much more that I wanted to say. I I know that Greenpeace has great cycling persuasion that um, can teach like any of the candidates to, to win. Uh, and to talk about issues. Um, but I guess I think that we could just talk about some of the issues here now, um, specifically the climate change and the sexual stuff. Um, so can we talk about issues and do we want to make that connection? I put in the chat that climate change leadership is feminine. Um, so might be a good time. Yeah, I think that as climate change permeates every office, even a secretary of state, you know? So um, in our community, it was kids who didn't feel that anybody was listening to them that demanded a plan from our city council and actually got one and got a pretty good one and one that needs to be updated probably every couple of years. And so there are so many levels of government that could affect issues of climate change, whether you're talking about electric, going back to electric buses, whether you're talking about making sure that public transit actually functions well in your community so more people will ride it, making sure that you're not incentivizing private vehicle use, making sure that local government is using renewable energy, making sure that the state is um, requiring energy companies to have a renewable program and an energy efficiency incentive program. So there are like just so many things that can be done, whether you're on a local level or a state level in terms of climate change. And it's just like got to happen now because uh, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, yeah. And so there's so many uh, other issues um, and how me too connects is like uh yeah it's possible so how about i get the clean way and um i wanted to make sure that we had a few moments for deb robin and amy who also had questions i don't mean to interrupt you chris uh that was just enough connection um i was just trying to make sure people don't get over focused like on climate change that it's also something that they talk about ubiquitously. Okay. Let's see, Amy, you've got a question. 
Yes, thank you. Um, I was just reading recently one of the dispatches from the Lavender Green Caucus about a group called the Turf Collective, which is either promising or threatening to uh, kind of build themselves a beachhead in as many local and state chapters as they can, kind of using our ideal of decentralization against us. Do you have any advice about how to combat that if it becomes necessary? Yeah, I don't think I really know exactly what you're talking about. Oh, but... turf, trans, ex trans excluding radical feminists. Yeah. So, Transphobics. Uh, yeah, I don't know that I have any advice for you. I think people need to be confronted about oppression, whether they're Greens or Reds or Dems or Republicans. And Thanks. people should be able to self-identify who they are in terms of sex and gender. Thanks. So not a strategy, just a statement. <laughs> and then Deborah, you had your hand up again as well. Oh, sorry, I was on you. Um, how does, like when you're running and someone is saying something about you that is not true like what they did with jill stein they accused her of so many things how do you combat stuff like that and stand your ground and be your authentic self and uh to combat also the the confusion that they're going to put out there for the public to make them doubt that candidate the cred credibility of that candidate. How do you combat that? Yeah, I, I think it has to be confronted. So a lot of times when I was running, people would say, they would actually say this, you're a young democratic socialist feminist and you're not married. How do you have any credibility? And I used to get real defensive about it. Like this is a nonpartisan race. My party doesn't make a difference. And then it's just like, no, 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 no. The whole reason I'm running is because of my socialist feminist values and my belief that we need to care for the earth in a whole different way. And, yes. and I needed to use that sharp question as a springboard to talk about my agenda. To say, no, I am, I am not a baby killer um, who, who worships Satan. I am actually, here's, here's who I am and what I care about and how I will behave as an elected official. So to confront it and to use it as a springboard to talk about your agenda. I think that's how you take control back. So I know that we don't have a lot of time and there's not a huge number of people I think on right now, but if we could go around and just say, something from our conversation this afternoon that made you think about things differently or something that was intriguing or helpful or refreshed um, uh, something for you, that would be helpful to me. And it's a good way to just have some closure before we leave each other. So why don't I just grab some people? Uh, I'll just start on the <laughs> bottom. There is Margo. Hi. I Hi, Margo. How are you, Karen? I'm good. So just random question. Is your bead uh, business uh, in Santa Monica, Venice? It is not. Is it? It is in Iowa City, Iowa. OK, because I came on late. But there's this bead store in Venice that I used to go to all the time when I lived in that <laughs> neighborhood. And it looks familiar. <laughs> anyway. Random, I apologize for that uh, distraction, but uh, I wanted to share that uh, I've been kind of politically homeless. You know, I've been an, ind an independent for 20 years. I uh, didn't vote in a lot of local elections because I'm also an entrepreneur and I'm adverse to the whole economic structure in this country from corporatism, uh, even to some of the policies coming out of Bernie Sanders group. I, so the Green Party, is becoming more and more like a home for me. And I'm glad to be here. I registered as a green last year for the first time and I voted for Howie. And 
uh, just listening to Angela, that feels like the closest representation to like feminist leadership right now to me. So that's why I'm here in this conversation today. So the last thing I'll share is that I want to help and I want to use my talents because I have a degree in PR and I've given my help to a lot of grassroots efforts for things over 20 years of work. And I also work in the arts. So I'm really interested in lifting up uh, and building coalitions with real feminists. I'm, and I, I'm really turned off by the co-optedness that I'm seeing in, in ways that um, is challenging me. So I'm, I'm grateful to be in this community because even the way Angela behaves publicly is kind of like the leadership I wanna see that I'm not seeing anywhere else. So um, if I can be of a support to some local candidates, uh, whether it's writing press releases or helping with bios or other forms of communication, that feels like a best, the best use of my skill set. And um, I was gonna follow up on the Green Socialist website later after, the, after this time uh, together this weekend to do that. Because I have been thinking, how can I support and build this party up? Because we desperately need um, a third party represented in a real way in this country. We need four or five more, six parties actually. Um, but the Green Party is aligned with my values as well. So that's great. We have one declared candidate already, Robin, who's this is her second run and second type of office. And maybe Robin and Margot can connect and have some really artful campaign materials. Um, I will share my email in chat if that's the best thing for me to do. Okay. And uh, if there's other female candidates that need help with writing, um, and I can get on the ground too. I really appreciate Howie's uh, objectives and building up locally. Uh, and I can help in that way. I just, I have a lot going on, like a lot of people, and I want to use my time and talents to the best benefit of the party. Okay. Thanks, Margo. We're, we're quickly, we have about five minutes left, and I want to make sure that anyone who wants to have their own last word can briefly just say if anything was helpful, intriguing, that will help them move forward um, about our conversation today. Let's see, there's Tina. Tina, you've been with us for a little bit. Any comments? Um, yeah, no, thank you for hosting this. I came in a little bit late. Um, some things that, that uh, struck me is that oftentimes I'm, I'm the, uh, the co-chair of Green Party of Pennsylvania. So, and I'm also on the media team. And a lot of times I forget that there's this whole women's caucus. <laughs> so when I saw that this was happening here um, today, that was immediately like, you know, I don't touch base with other female candidates. And that I think that's very important because we have many different um, issues that happen within us trying to get our names out there. A lot of times um, toxicity um, that was mentioned earlier, you know, can come about that directly because of our gender. Um, and uh, I wanted to mention that I'm running for governor in 2022 in Pennsylvania. So. Awesome. That's, that's it, but that's that's so much drop. Drop. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Exactly. And I just butt in, uh, and Hillary mentioned this too, but if you go to uh, gp.org and look under Coordinated Campaign Committee, you will find, uh, and hopefully this will be included uh, along with the national meeting workshops, but this one and others that Karen and, and we have put on webinars, trainings, and uh, uh, we'll be having a list of ever increasingly updated list of candidates and including women candidates. The Women's Caucus also helps look into that and do what they can to promote, publicize, and sometimes even offer a little bit of funding, not much, but so, so all that's in the work, in the works, and people can check those out for resources. Dave? Oh, okay. Anybody else wanna say anything before we leave each other's company? Chris physically has his hand up. Thank you for that, Chris. Well, I, I just wanna mention that, uh, COP26 is the most important thing on the agenda. And what we must do is pretty much start world government and assign the energy for reindustrialization. Um, basically, we got to switch to world democracy and 
triage the remaining carbon budget. Um, and so I just want to make sure that's on your agenda. It's only like a month or something away or a couple. I don't know. Thanks, Chris. And uh, just before I wrap up, I did want to just touch. Gloria has been very patiently waiting. Thank you, Gloria. That's, that's okay. I was having some trouble with mics and videos. And thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate this. I just want to say quickly that I, I appreciate you saying like, hey, you know, I'm socialist and that's what that means. And I was kind of out there doing that, but not in a sectarian way, not in a formulaic way. I My first ran for office uh, in 2001. Um, I was a socialist and independent for a long time. I went to the Greens because that seemed to fit in terms of the electoral work and, and my other work. And I was just kind of matter of fact about it. And what does it mean in everyday lives? And what does it mean in people's lives on a city level and a state level and a national level? And so I really appreciate that because sometimes I think in the party, there's some hard lines and there's some miscommunications. Um, and the more we can break down those barriers and say, just look at our platform. Um, it's about social justice. It's about a just society. Um, so thank you so much, Karen. Yeah. So I do also want to encourage you to think about um, starting a campaign early, asking for the help that you need, putting yourself out there, and uh, making sure you say a lot of thank yous. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you, everybody. I hope you all have a safe night and uh, enjoy the rest of the events this evening. I believe there's one more event this evening, right? The bill. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Good. all. Yeah, and I'll, I can just say I had a chance to get a sneak preview of the film, and it's really powerful. And we're going to have a panel with Robin and some of the survivors, and it will be a powerful event. So please join us. Good night, everyone. Thanks. See you soon.